It's great to see you. I also want to welcome those that are joining us online. We're so glad that you're part with us. On that page you're at online, you can actually fill out a virtual connection card. And then at the bottom, there's an opportunity to download our app, and I'm saying that for everyone here as well. You can get that on any uh, major platform. We really encourage that because it's going to help you uh, stay up to date on what's happening, stay involved in everything, know what's coming. Everybody likes to know what's coming, don't we, right? No big surprises, right? Some of us do. <laughs> hey, I want to I give you some dates. Um, you can pull your paper notes out right away and write these dates down. Next Sunday, which is September 18th, I really want to encourage you, set that day aside, clear your calendar, because a great friend of this ministry, Arnie Jacobson, is going to be with us in the house, and he's going to be sharing uh, on some things that you just don't want to miss. I'll be talking about that at the end of the message. Then the following week is going to be, I'm, I'm going to call it um, fill-in-the-blank type of Sunday. We are kicking off the life groups this week, and yeah. And there's some things that uh, I want to share to bring some clarification. And then the following Sunday, October 2nd, please push everything else aside because we are actually doing a pre-release for our At The Movie series. And if you've never been a part of that, you're going to love that. But one of our overseers, Pastor Hal Hardy from the Atlanta area, is going to be with us here with his wife, Sandra, and you don't want to miss that. So the next three weeks are going to be pretty amazing, and then going beyond that, it's, it's going to be like off the charts. But today, we are, in, we are in the next part of our series called Prospering with a Purpose. And Prospering with a Purpose, last week we talked about how biblical prosperity and worldly prosperity are two completely separate things. You know, worldly prosperity is all about getting and then spending. But biblical prosperity is all about sowing and then reaping and with the increase, advancing the kingdom of God. That's really what's on the heart of God. And so this week, we're going to talk about our exodus towards ministry expansion. And I, I think you're going to enjoy this message. I'd like you to turn... Uh, on your devices or in your paper Bibles, or we're going to put the scriptures on the screen to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, and we're going to start writing 1 through 4. This is Paul, Rabbi Paul, the Apostle Paul, speaking to the church in Corinth, which was filled with Gentiles, by the way. There were some Jews, but it was mostly Gentiles. He says, I don't want you to forget, dear brothers and sisters, about our ancestors in the wilderness long ago. All of them were guided by a cloud that moved ahead of them, and all of them walked through the sea on dry ground. He's talking about the parting of the Red Sea. In the cloud and in the sea, all of them were baptized as followers of Moses. So he's drawing a parallel here of moving through a process, and he's kind of connecting that water with baptism. He said, all of them ate the same spiritual food. Remember, they were fed manna, bread from heaven. And all of them drank the same spiritual water. For they drank from the spiritual rock that traveled with them. And that rock was Christ. Now, we know from the Exodus account that God split the rock in the wilderness and water flooded out. And the psalmists talk about there being a pool of water in the rock in the wilderness. And if you go to Saudi Arabia today, you can see the rock that God split. It's very obvious. It's got a big split down the center. It's probably 50, 60 feet high. You can also see Mount Sinai there, which in Arabic is Jabal el Laws, And it still has remains and archaeological remains of the Israelites that camped around that mountain, as well as God descending on that mountain in fire. The whole top of that mountain, which is granite, is scorched black. So he's drawing a parallel here for us and the Corinthian church to help us understand that we're on a journey together. But then he gives a warning in verse 11, and he says this, These things happen to them, get it, as examples... For us. 
They were written down to warn us who live at the end of the age. Now, if Paul was saying we're at the end of the age 2,000 years ago, then I think we're more than at the end of the end of the age today. Can you say amen? And so we have to be careful because unfortunately that whole generation that came out of Egypt, they got off track. And they ended up turning their backs on God and they ended up all dying out in the wilderness. And that's not going to happen to us. That's not going to happen to our generation. Not on my watch. Hey, turn to two people next to you and say, that's not my story. (laughs) Now, God's people have always been set free for purpose and on purpose. And so I'd like you to take out your devices or write in your paper notes. Write this down. This is important. I was set free. You were set free to follow God. We were set free to follow God. And it's interesting. We read in Corinthians, it says this. The people of Israel had lived in Egypt for 430 years. In fact, it was on the last day of the 430th year that all the Lord's forces left the land. Now, why is that significant? Well, exactly to the day 430 years earlier, God had inaugurated his covenant with Abraham through sacrifice and said that I'm going to be with you, Abraham. I'm going to walk with you. Your descendants are going to walk with me. And God challenged him to a life and walk of faith. And that's why Abraham is called the patriarch of faith. So it was exactly on the last day of that 430 years that the Lord's forces left. Now, God in Scripture has got a title that he loves to go by, and it's Yahweh Sebaot. And Yahweh Sebaot means the Lord of hosts or the Lord of the armies of heaven. And he likes to go by that title. Paul goes on and says, On this night, the Lord kept his promise to bring his people out of the land of Egypt. So this is Passover where they're commemorating this. So this night belongs to him. And it must be commemorated every year by all the Israelites from generation to generation. Passover is the oldest religious rite still being practiced today. It's thousands of years old. And in the springtime during Passover, Jewish families all over the world commemorate this exodus into freedom, and the centerpiece of it is a lamb. And if you look at the Passover meal that they share, it is full of rich symbolism, and here's the thing, it all points to their Messiah, Jesus Christ. So if you have Jewish friends It's good to pray for them, but especially during Passover, you can pray, God, remove the veil so that they will get a revelation of the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And that will go on forever. And so this covenant was made with Abraham. This covenant was made with us through him, and God is faithful to keep his promises. You see, the first steps out of any old lifestyle, whether it's sin or otherwise, they're always by faith. We take a step of faith, not quite knowing what's ahead, but trusting that God is leading you towards a preferred future and drawing you to a place where you can follow him in freedom and in truth. And so whatever it is in your life, And I try to make this a practice in my life. When God is calling me further to take a new step, a new step of faith in something, I'm going to put my focus on him and and confess over and over and over, God, I can't do this without you. 
because I don't know what's ahead. You know what's ahead, but I don't know what's ahead. And so I'm going to follow you, and I'm going to trust you in a new step of faith. Here's the second thing I want you to write down. You and I were set free to help others find God. You weren't just set free for your own sake, but you and I were set free for the sake of others. In Exodus chapter 12, verse 37, we read this. The Israelites journeyed from Ramesses to Sukkot. They were about 600,000 men on foot besides women and children. So this, this is a crowd. <laughs> Many other people went up with them. I don't know if you've ever seen that before. And also large droves of livestock, both flocks and herds. Non-Hebrews left Egypt with Israel that day. Non-Jewish people, if you will. In fact, it says some of the Egyptians left with them because the Egyptians were in awe of this God who had conquered all of their gods. You see, in the, in the Mesopotamian mindset, their God conquered all of my gods, therefore, I'm going with them, <laughs> right? I want to be on that team, not on the losing team. And the thing is, God's freedom, you guys, is not just for us. It's for everyone around us as well. It's for our family. It's for our friends. It's for those that we come in contact with. It's it's for our coworkers. It's for the whosoever would take a step towards God. You know, this is why we're prospered. We are blessed to be a blessing. And we're a blessing to others in that way. I remember when I first gave my life to Christ, I shared my faith with anything that moved. Anything that wasn't nailed down, I somehow cornered and started talking about the Lord. I, I, just, I just found myself steering every conversation I had to start talking about Jesus because I was so excited about what he set me free from. You see, I knew me. Do you know you? I knew me. And the me that I knew wasn't so great. And so as God set me free, I was excited to tell others. And so that's one of the reasons that, that we have reset all the chairs. You probably noticed that they were reset when you came in. Now, the COVID is spa spacing is gone. We pulled out the extra chairs. We are setting for increase. Can you say amen? amen. I told some of this. Yeah, come on now. <laughs> Doesn't look too bad in here right now, but there's room for more, especially in these front chairs. Let me start paying some people to start sitting up front here. <laughs> but I'm just saying, we, we are ready for that. I just, I did, I told some of the staff, I just stood by, I stood back, I wanted to see when people walked in and just saw, you know, their space was gone, your space was gone, right? All of a sudden, uh-oh, uh-oh. <laughs> Because we're all creatures of habit, including me. I drink out of the same mug every Sunday morning. I've got a special mug that I drink out of every Sunday morning. And so I always make sure it's clean. And if it comes to the front of the cabinet, I put it all the way in back. So I make sure it's all ready to go on Sunday. That's just, I'm a creature of habit too. And so we're all like pigeons. <laughs> You know, we, we perch in the same spot. And that's how I can know maybe you're here or maybe not here that day. I know who sits back there. I know who sits over here in general. I know who sits over in this section as well. And by the way, I, I want to share this with you too. I'm getting off track, but that's okay. <laughs> the side sections, these two sections, and then the far sections, those are set up for a little quieter experience on Sunday. So if, if you are looking for just a little bit quieter experience, you can go ahead, you can sit on the side. You can still see and everything, but um, we set that up intentionally just for people who, who may need that or desire that. And I'm not saying anybody's old in this room, okay? I'm not saying that. The only person that I know that's old is my dad. He's old. My dad is a day older than dirt. No, he is. He's 95 years old. 
I talked to him the other day. He's, he, he had horses. He had 12 acres and all that. And then my mom passed away and his life really changed. So he had to sell his horses and that. He said, yeah, I am. He said, Mike, I'm slowing down. I said, well, how so, Dad? He said, I, I can only mow two out of the 12 acres. <laughs> I said, that's okay, Dad. <laughs> you just take your time. They'll be there. I said, you'll be there too. Just take your time on it. <laughs> I love my dad. <laughs> so, you guys, we are, we are set free really to help other people. It's not just for us. It's for others as well. Here's the third thing I, I, I want you to write down, and, and this is supremely important. You were set free to worship God. You were set free to worship God. In Exodus chapter 12, verse 31, we read this. Pharaoh sent for Moses and Aaron during the night. I'm going to try to do my best Yul Brenner impression. Get out, he ordered. Leave my people and take the rest of the Israelites with you. Go and worship the Lord as you have requested. Take your flocks and your herds as you said and be gone. How was that? It was pretty good. All right. <laughs> Kind of makes it more real, doesn't it? Don't ask me to shave my head. Not going there. The brothers look good. I wouldn't. I've got some lumps up here. Anyways, so Pharaoh forced them out of Egypt. The people forced them out of Egypt. And that's because after that 10th plague, which was the death of all the firstborn in Egypt, it shattered the nation. There wasn't any household exempted. Pharaoh's son died. All the firstborn in Egypt died. And that was a redemptive plague. I'd love to go into detail on that. But that tenth plague was a redemptive plague that actually took the place of the Israelites. We'll talk about that at some point. But you know, on the cross... When Christ freely gave up his life for us, he defeated sin, he defeated Satan, and a lot of people will say sickness, and I agree with that, but he, he defeated something even more sinister than that. He defeated our selfishness, our self-centeredness, our desire to have the whole universe orbit around us. You can be free from selfishness. You can be free and notice that there's a whole world out there dying apart from Christ because, because of his sacrifice on the cross. You see, his death was redemptive for us. And he wants to redeem every part of your life. He wants to redeem your time. He wants to have you every day ask him to redeem the day and make it something that is pleasing to him. Some of you notice, I wear a ring on my right hand. It's a, it's a silver ring. I know, a, I know a third generation jeweler in the old city in Jerusalem. An Arab gentleman, he's wonderful. Love him. And anytime I go there, I bring people there. Because you can get jewelry made, Christian jewelry, whatever you want, he will make it for you. And I remember years ago I was there. I was going through a, a difficult time. I was there by myself. And I asked him to make this ring. And in Hebrew, it says this. Ani yadati goli chai. And what that means is, I know my Redeemer lives. And so every morning, every morning, when I put this on, I tell the Lord Jesus, I know that you're alive. I know that you want to redeem my day. I know that you want to make something beautiful out of it. And so God not only want, wants to redeem your time, he wants to redeem your talents, your gifts, your abilities as well. 
And that's why every Sunday now we've opened up another opportunity for every Sunday for you to come in and walk out of here knowing what your spiritual gifts and abilities are. Because 87% of the body of Christ has no idea what they are. And that's not on them, it's on the leaders of the body of Christ for not providing opportunities. And so we used to give 12 opportunities a year for it. Now we're going to give every Sunday that you can leave here knowing, okay, these are my gifts and my abilities. And God wants to redeem them on the dream team. He wants to redeem them at work. He wants to redeem them in your family so that you can know why you were created. And when you know why you were created and how God created you, you your design determines your destiny. Because God loves to have his people enjoy what they do. And so that's our focal point, to see that your gifts and abilities are redeemed and stewarded well. And that's why the dream team is so important here. And that's why you knowing that outside these walls is so very, very important. Can you say amen? God also wants to redeem our treasure, our finances. He wants to see us prosper, but again, he wants to see us prosper with a purpose behind it. Not so that we can get and get and get and never, never do anything with it, just sit on it, but he just, he wants you to really understand that, he, that we are a conduit. He wants to flow money through us. And that's why when you give, you give not to the church, but through the church, because we're a conduit for life transformation. So all the Israelites have moved out into the desert. And God brought them all the way out there so that he could have their undivided attention. Do you know that he had to fight for it out there? <laughs> With all the, It's unbelievable when you read the account. We don't want to be like that. We want to be thankful and grateful, not complaining and bitter. Amen? And so what he did was he had the Israelites plunder Egypt, which is a picture of the world. He had them plunder them. We read this in, in Exodus chapter 12, verse 35. It says, And the people of Israel did as Moses had instructed. They asked the Egyptians for clothing and articles of silver and gold. The Lord caused the Egyptians to look favorably on the Israelites. And what that means is like, get out. We don't want to die. Get out. Just take it. Here, take this too. Take the whole thing. He wanted them out. And they gave the Israelites whatever they asked for. So they stripped the Egyptians of their wealth. Was it so that they could just look great out in the desert? No. He had a purpose behind it. See, God was going to have them build his tabernacle, and he knew that these were all the materials that they would not be able to find out in the desert. There's not a whole lot of wood out in the desert. And so he had them plunder the Egyptians to bring all of that out. And so we read this. The Lord said to Moses, tell the people of Israel to bring me their sacred offerings. Accept the contributions from all whose hearts are moved to offer them. Now that's very important. We talked last week about the motives of the heart and how you should never, ever be coerced into giving. That's not a godly thing. He's looking for cheerful givers. He's looking for those that are willingly and open-handedly saying, God, thank you for all that you did for me. Here's a portion of what you've given me. And so here's a list of sacred offerings you may accept from them. And, and he goes through the list. Gold, silver, and bronze, blue, purple, and scarlet thread. Interesting. Fine linen, goat hair for cloth, tanned ram skins, and fine goat skin Leather, acacia wood, olive oil for the lamps, spices for the anointing oil, and the fragrant incense, onyx stones, and other gemstones to be set in the ephod and the priest's chest piece. So the priest wore a special chest piece 
And in there, there are these precious stones. And just like a jeweler engraves, or actually is like a, a, a bas relief, the names of Israel were on all these stones. Each tribe. He says, have the people of Israel build me a holy sanctuary so I can live among them. And then this is very important. You must build this tabernacle, God's dwelling place, and its furnishings exactly according to the pattern I will show you. So they just couldn't, you know, slap something together and say, God, here's your house, inhabit it. No, there was actually a purpose on how he wanted it to look because the whole thing really was a picture of Messiah. Every piece of furniture, every part of the tent, even how you approached the tent and moved your way further into the presence of God, it was all a picture of Messiah. Now, why is this important? Well, because God has given us a pattern for our ministry, for us here at Metro Harvest. And I want to share this with you. See, 10 years ago, it was on March 6th, 2012, and I know that date, it was a Tuesday, because I was down in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, at a conference for pastors. And in the morning, I'm in the hotel room, my devotional was out of Numbers chapter 8, verses 1 and 2. Now, for a lot of people, the Old Testament, and especially the book of Numbers, is not the most exciting book. In fact, if you're reading through your Bible in a year, sometimes you just want to get through some of those chapters, especially in Leviticus and Numbers, because it's, you know, it gets really in the weeds on all this stuff. And so I'm reading through this, and I'm like, oh, that's interesting. Okay, that's cool. But then the Holy Spirit, He arrested me. And I, I couldn't continue past those first two verses. And I'm like, Lord, what, what are you saying to me here? And so I want to read those first two verses out of Numbers chapter 8 to you. It said, The Lord said to Moses, Give Aaron the following instructions. So Moses gave instructions to his brother Aaron, who was the high priest. When you set up the seven lamps in the lampstand, place them so that their light shines forward in front of the lampstand. So Aaron did this. He set up the seven lamps so they reflected their light forward just as the Lord had commanded Moses. The entire lampstand from its base to its decorative blossoms was made of beaten gold it was built, here it is, according to the exact design the Lord had shown Moses. And so I'm reading this, and I can't go any further. And the Holy Spirit began to speak to me, and he said, this is going to typify what your ministry is. I'm like, what? And he told me, he said, when you return, I want Metro Harvest Church to plant seven churches internationally so that the light shines forward. And if you are faithful to do that, then I will do this in the Metro Milwaukee area. And I just, I'm writing all this down. And so I went to the conference, and I'm sitting there, and I'm not hearing a word that Pastor Larry is saying. <laughs> All I'm doing is, this is just, and, and I know what a menorah looks like, and I'm just thinking through this, and the guy sitting next to me, his name is Pastor Jack Haynes, and Pastor Jack Haynes was an Assembly of God pastor who happened to be in charge of all of Australia, <laughs> He was, he was in charge of Australia for church planting there. And I leaned over and I said, Jack, this is what happened to me this morning. And I just recounted to him what I told you. And he, and he said, he leans over, he goes, Mike, that's the Lord. 
That is, he said, I'm going to be praying for you. And so as Pastor Larry's talking, he began talking about church planting. And now I kind of, yeah, yeah, you know, I got, he, he had my attention again. And I'm listening because Pastor Larry founded an organization called Surge. And what Surge is, it was the ability for churches to plant other churches in a very specific way. They would raise up indigenous pastors and then the church that was going to plant that church would support that pastor for an entire year, pay his salary for a year as he got the church up and running, he got out of his job into the position of a pastor and then the church became self-sufficient. And so literally, literally, I got home, some of you might remember this, I began sharing this vision, and we began church, planting churches. And the supernatural happened. We planted two churches the first year. And then we planted another church the next year. And then the next year we planted two more. Long story short, we planted all of those seven churches. And that's, yeah, we, I wanna say thank you to God. But here's the thing, maybe you weren't here for that. I want to tell you, because you're here now, your fruit is accruing in heaven in other countries because you are part of that now. And so, once those churches were planted, it's like the screen went dark. <laughs> and... Um, I just said, okay, Lord, in, in your time. Because whenever something goes dark in your life on some, something like that, it means the curtain's down, you're between acts, something's being rearranged behind the curtain, and then the curtain's going to go up again. That's how God does it. Why don't you guys go ahead and put that, that first slide up, please? You guys, this is a menorah, okay? And this is roughly what the, the menorah in the temple looked like, okay? And so God said in Exodus 25, 31, he said, make a lampstand of pure gold, hammered gold. Make the entire lampstand and its decorative pieces one piece. So this was made out of one solid piece of gold. About 75 pounds of gold, if you can imagine that. The base, the center, the stem, the lamps, the cups, the buds, and the petals. So I want to show you just a simplified menorah. Some of you have seen this because you came out on that windy, snowy, rainy, sleety night in February for the financial vision night. But this is a good refresher. Go ahead and put the other menorah up. This is a simplified menorah, what we were talking about. In Numbers 8-2, the entire lampstand from its base to its decorative blossoms were made of beaten gold. That means it was hammered. How many of you know God's process is the hammering is part of the process to just beat and shape and mold and conform us to the image of Christ? It was built according to the exact design the Lord had shown Moses. Then in Exodus 25, it says, craft the center stem with four lamp cups. Here they are, one, two, three, four shaped like almond blossoms, complete with buds and petals. And so let's go ahead and put up that next slide. The centerpiece of this lampstand are these, and there's four of them. And these have to do with our vision. The first one is to know God, to have a relationship with Him, to not just know about God, but to know him personally. And my question to you and to those watching, do you know him? Do you know him? Do you want to draw closer to him? See, he wants us to know him beyond Sunday school, beyond confirmation. He wants to dwell in the sanctuary of your heart so that you know, that you know, that you know you're headed for heaven. The second part of our vision is kind of like this 
Second cup here, it's to find freedom. It's to put your yesterdays in the rearview mirror and to be able to go forward in life. And that may mean forgiving people. That may mean just setting them free. Because as you set others free, you become free. And that's why God brought us out of Egypt. He brings us out of the world. He brings us out of Egypt, but then he's got to get the Egypt out of us. And that's the way we find freedom. And life groups are a wonderful way to do that. That's how we do it here. If you really want to be well-pastored in this church, become part of a life group. That's the best way to be connected. That's the best way to feel and be pastored. The third cup there is to discover your purpose, and we've already talked about that. We're giving opportunities to do that now every single week because your design determines your destiny. And then that fourth cup, that last one, is once you know those things, then you can make a difference in your world. See, God has hardwired you and me to help people to make, a dif- to make a difference in their lives so that they can come to know God, so that they can find freedom, discover their purpose, make a difference, so that they can keep repeating the process over and over and over. I've thought a lot about this. And in the last year and a half, This whole thing just started coming up alive in my heart once again. It was like that curtain was starting to to go up. And I was like, what is underneath there? (laughs) What's going on back there? I was like, oh my, I I didn't expect that. In the book of Revelation, the disciple, the apostle John, who is the beloved of Jesus. This is the same John that leaned up against Jesus' chest the night that he was betrayed, that Passover night before he was crucified. Can you imagine hearing the heartbeat of God like that? He was that close with Jesus. Before his faith, he was exiled onto the island of Patmos. Patmos is just a rock out in the middle of nowhere. And the reason he was exiled, tradition tells us, they tried to execute him by burning him alive with oil. But he survived. And so Roman justice was fulfilled. He survived. And so they exiled him. So we read this. This is his account. This is the book of Revelation. Chapter 1, verse 12 He heard a voice behind him, and he says, when I turned to see who was speaking to me, and if you guys, if you don't have the scripture, this is fine, I'll read it, I saw seven gold lampstands. See, I believe when he turned around, he saw a menorah. He didn't see individuals. This was seven gold lampstands, and standing in the middle lampstand, was someone like the Son of Man. He was wearing a long robe with a gold sash across his chest. His head and hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like flames of fire. His feet were like polished bronze refined in a furnace, and his voice thundered like mighty ocean waves. He held seven stars in his right hand, and a sharp two-edged sword came from his mouth, and his face was like the sun in its brilliance. What you need to understand about the menorah is this center lampstand is called the shamash. It's the servant lamp. That is the place Jesus occupied. And then we read this in Revelation 1, verse 20. This is the meaning of the mystery of the seven stars you saw in my right hand and the seven gold lampstands. The seven stars are the angels. That means messengers or pastors of the seven churches. And the seven lampstands are the seven churches. So now that those seven churches have been planted, I believe God wants to do that here. And that would mean for us planting six more campuses 
like this one in the four-county area, Ozaki County, Washington County, Waukesha County, and Milwaukee County. I really believe that God is going to have us raise up a pastoral team of men that are going to walk together, eat together, prefer one another, one vision, one heart, one voice, one budget, all over this area. We're called to multiply ourselves, yeah. Now, will it be a little new, unique because it's a different person? Absolutely, but it'll be the same message. Will it be a little different because it may be on the east side of Milwaukee or out in Lake Country or out in Ozaki County? Yeah, it'll be a little bit different, but it'll be the same. Just the continuity of what God wants to do. One message shared through seven voices. And so this is how the Lord has led us to do it. Next week, we are launching something called One Light. And One Light is a campaign, and it's because of all this. And we're launching a ministry expansion effort so that over the next three years, our goal is to raise $250,000 above our regular giving. Now, I, I shared last week, we're not raising money because the church is hurting and we can't keep our lights on. <laughs> this church, the giving already this year is 37% higher than it was last year. And last year was a great year. Yeah, we can thank God for that. So that's not what this is about. This is $250,000 in the next three years over and above. And there's three objectives for this, and this, these are the three objectives. The first one, and you may want to be writing this down, the first one is we want to improve our position, okay? We want to improve our position. And the way we're going to do that is we're going to reduce the mortgage and pay the mortgage off on this facility in three years or less in Jesus' name. Now, for those of you that are wondering, we owe 441000 $314.16, and this mortgage is paid off. And so, if you're standing around and you cough, <coughs> and $441,314.16 falls out of your pants pocket, come and call me, okay? Because <laughs> we'll put it to good use. We will retire that, this debt immediately. That's several thousand dollars immediately that goes towards ministry expansion. The second thing that we're going to do is we're going to improve our building. The interior is fairly nice in here, but the, the exterior needs a little help. It needs new paint. The parking lot needs updated. It just, it just needs a facelift. You know what I'm talking about? And so we will put about $50,000 of that money towards renovating the exterior of the building. And then with the remainder what we're going to do is we're going to start to increase our presence in the area. We're going to begin planting congregations, planting campuses, and we're praying about strategically the where and the how and the when. Now, I want to share this before. If you're here today and you've been part of a traditional campaign in other churches, this is not that. See, we are taking a discipleship emphasis towards it. And what I mean by a discipleship emphasis towards it is this. Our goal, and the reason that we're all doing the same thing together, and that's why I, all, I want all of you to be in these life groups, is because we're going to be studying about biblical generosity. And God's going to use it to speak to you about areas that he wants you to take a step forward in. And then Pastor Arnie, who helped us actually get in this building years ago, he's going to launch the campaign. And then down the road, down the road this semester, we want to meet with a group of you on a Tuesday night, and we just want to talk to you. And our goal is to help you take a step in faith. And for some of you, maybe that's, that's a step towards percentage giving. For others, that may be a step towards tithing for the first time and being able to trust God with all of that. And so as we're going through this study, I think God's going to really speak to you. I want to share this with you, and I want to set some of you free right now. One of the things I'm going to be doing in two weeks is I'm going to be theologically filling in some gaps in the book that we're studying. 
I love Robert Morris, and I, I, I chose that book because it's so inspiring, his stories in the giving. But theologically, there's some things that I think need a little refinement. And one of the things that I want to set you free on is this. Tithing or the giving of 10% is not a New Testament command. Wow, somebody just started breathing in here. <laughs> you, you cannot biblically support the command to tithe in the New Testament. But in two weeks, I'm going to explain to you why tithing is such a good idea. And one of them is this. Just because something is right under the law doesn't make it wrong under grace. And tithing actually does fulfill what we are commanded to do in the New Testament. And I will be looking at five areas with you two weeks from today. And I think it's really going to help you. So I want you to be set free right now. We're not, I'm not going to make you feel like I did in that meeting where I felt like I was being held by my ankles, being shaken upside down until all the change fell out of my pockets. That's not going to happen here. But I think you are going to be inspired to take a step forward in your giving. I'm going to pastor you through this. You may have questions as we go along, and I'm going to try my best to answer those questions, and I'm available to you as well. But as a church, we're going to just move forward. And just like there were miracles in the Exodus, God is going to do miracles in your life and in my life as well. He's going to stretch us because His heart if we lay our head back on the, on the chest of Jesus, his heart is beating for souls. For the people that are far from him, that he loves so much and died to ensure that they have a place in heaven. I would just like all of us to just close our eyes and bow our heads And you may be here today and you may be listening to this message or you may be watching online and you'd say, Pastor Mike, I just feel so far from God. I knew him at one point, but I somehow just drifted away. I don't want to be like those Israelites that missed it. I want to be among those who walk into God's promised land. Or maybe you've never heard what I'm sharing before and you've never heard that Jesus died for your sins, you personally, that if you were the only person on earth who had ever sinned, Christ still would have come and died for you because he loves you that much. I want to lead you in a simple prayer to invite Christ into your life. Now, if you already know Christ, I want you to be praying for those that don't know Christ. Maybe a mom, a dad, a sister, brother, aunt, uncle. Or maybe some in this room. But if you would like to be included in on that prayer, this isn't about joining this church. This is about becoming right with the God who loves you. If you'd like to be included in on that, would you just quickly lift up your hand so that I can see it? If that's you, you need to either receive the Lord or get back to Christ today. God bless you. I see that hand, young lady. Are there others here? Thank you, Father. If you're watching at home, just lift up your hand. God sees you, and he knows your heart. I'd like us all just to pray together, agree together right now. Let's say this out loud. Lord Jesus, I need you. I need you to come into my life. Save me from my sin. And help me follow you. I submit to you to conform my life to your image. I choose to follow you. Thank you for forgiving me. 
I'll follow you in water baptism and be a bold testimony for you. And I thank you for saving me. I thank you for receiving me back. In Jesus' name.